recording and we will get started. Um, welcome everyone and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is a workshop tonight with Canon Suzanne Edwards Acton talking about my work to do. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank Ms. Ada Ramirez and Ms. Andrea Valencia for providing Spanish translation for today's session. And Andrea, would you be so kind as to let us know how interpretation will work? Thank you, Samantha. Hi, everyone. Um, in a few seconds, we will activate the feature for interpretation, which means that an icon in the form of a world will pop up at the bottom of the uh, screen ne next to the controls, your Zoom controls. Um, so uh, make sure to select your language as English in case you would like to hear anybody that may ask a question into Spanish. Otherwise, you can um, leave it on selected if you wish. And now I'm gonna repeat the same um, message in Spanish for any Spanish speakers that may be present. Buenas noches a todos y a todas. Esta noche este evento presentará interpretación simultánea al español a través de Zoom. En unos momentos activaremos la funcionalidad. Aparecerá un icono en forma de mundo en la parte inferior en los controles de Zoom en donde podrá seleccionar español para escuchar al intérprete. Muchas gracias. Thank you. You can go ahead and activate it now so everyone can see the option. All right, the option should have popped up for everyone. So make sure to select your language. Um, so as a reminder, the session is being recorded and will later be posted to the diocesan Facebook page and YouTube channel. The recording will remain available for viewing on demand. A link to that video along with the resources presented will also be available on the convention website at www.diocesanconvention.com. And now I turn it to you, Suzanne. Thank you. We are going to um, run this time together the way that we actually do my work to do. And my work to do uh, started about three years ago um, as a space for white people specifically and people of color who are allies to white people in their journey um, for people to develop stamina for conversations around race. So um, we are gonna go ahead and just get started and we're gonna run it the way that we do. And several of the people on the screen are co-facilitators. So they spend a lot of their week um, in session supporting the space, my work to do space. And um, there's a few people on the screen who are here uh, with us, um, but who have never experienced it. So if you wonder like, well, why is she not calling on those people? Well, it's because they are not our co-facilitators. And so they're here with you in this recorded Landia, um, just having an experience of my work to do. So here we go. My work to do, um, circular agreement. And I am reading just for those of you who have never experienced this before. This is what we always do. My work to do is an intentionally white centered space for white people and their people of color allies who are comfortable and not triggered in all white spaces. This group is not designed as a safe space for people of color. There will likely be parts of this listening and learning experience that will be uncomfortable. The intent is not discomfort, but the reality is that this work is uncomfortable at times and we intentionally do not shy away from that discomfort. Invitations to share will be timed one to three minutes, depending which round in the process. At the end of the pre-designated time, the facilitator will simply say, thank you. That means that your time to share has ended, please stop. You may choose to pass when offered your opportunity to share with the group in any given round. The facilitator will return to you at the end of the round. Please consider sharing at that point before the group moves on to the next round. No matter how big or small, deep or shallow, you consider the content of your share to be. Hearing from everyone in the group helps all participants to learn and grow. Please do not interrupt another participant during their share. This is a personal reflection space. The articles, readings, and videos will teach us. We will learn from listening to others share, but we are not here to teach or call out or school each other. People will say things that you do not like. Reflecting on that is part of your work to do. Changing someone else is not. When you disagree, the appropriate response is something like, I'm still processing that topic, that thought, that point, and I'm trying to make meaning for myself. We purposefully do not thank or congratulate people for participating. We purposefully do not incorporate an explicitly gentle 
neatly wrapped up feel good ending to the circle session. By coming to the circle, we all agree to double confidentiality. In this case, it's being recorded. So that's a little bit different. First, what is said in the circle stays in this circle. Second, participants may share something in the circle that they do not have an interest in talking about after the session outside of the circle. Ask first, do not assume that it is okay to continue the conversation outside of the circle. You may find that you'd like to participate in this series more than once. That is welcome and encouraged. When you come to the circle, please bring something to write on, such as paper or a journal, something to write with, such as a pen or pencil, a timer, an open heart, and an open mind. So now I'll ask if, uh, Samantha, if you can post the invitation to Brave Space, and Allie is going to read that for us. Yeah, bear with me just a moment. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. Thank you, Ethan, thanks. Now we will introduce ourselves and the facilitators, well, the co-facilitators will do that the same way that we do. Um, we. We introduce ourselves by saying our name, our location, and our race. I'm Suzanne. I'm in Eagle Rock, Los Angeles, California, and I'm Black. Joyce. Joyce Swabing from Laguna Niguel, California. I'm Asian Pacific Islander. Rick. I'm Rick. I live in Redlands, California, and I am white. Dominique. I'm Dominique. I'm in Carson, California, and I'm Black. Allie. I'm Allie, I'm in Denver, Colorado, and I'm white. Liz. You're mute, Liz. I'm Liz, I'm in Richmond, California, and I'm a Mestiza Chicana. It's Keith. I'm Keith, I'm in Upland, California, and I'm Asian. Kendall. I'm Kendall, I live in Los Angeles, California, and I'm Black. Aaron. I'm Aaron, I live in Inglewood, California. I'm Jody. Hi, I'm Jody. I live in Persephone, New Jersey, and I'm Black. Thanks. So for tonight, um, what we do typically is we do some journaling, and then we um, either we will read some content together or we will watch a video together. And then we do what's called constructivist listening, which is timed shares. So for tonight, I asked everyone, the prompt that I gave them is, can you please tell in four minutes, tell people about your experience of my work to do. So we'll do constructivist listening. I will be timing. You might not be able to see that, but I will be timing and people will be um, doing their shares. So first is, let's see, Joyce. Because Alyssa and Beth are not here. Yep, Joyce. Okay, all right. So in my youth and young adulthood, I often felt like I was standing outside a candy store waiting to be invited in. I realized that when I participated in my work to do in predominantly a space of mostly white people, I often feel like I'm still on the outside and yet allowing myself to be in that beautiful space helped me enlarge my capacity for being in brave space and telling my truth and accepting the beauty of what my culture and my upbringing and my race has in comparison, not one being better than the other, but really having just a platform to really listen and to hear. And then I also had another experience where I participated with 
all people were um, people of color. And there was a, a sense of ease for me and a sense that I could speak my truth without having to explain anything, which also created a sense of peace and acceptance that was really meaningful. And I felt uplifted and cared for, heard and understood. And it was really an enriching life experience for me. Very good. Great. Thank you. Um, I had just completed last year my training as a spiritual director with Still Point. And then the then COVID hit. And then in May, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, shortly after that, I received an invitation from a friend to join my work to do. And I went through um, several sessions throughout the summer. And in the fall, Suzanne sent me an invitation to uh, join as a co-facilitator. And there's a difference that I experienced between being a participant Although as a co-facilitator, we are participants in the process. But um, as the difference between the summer, really learning uh, about whiteness and systemic racism and internalized biases. I mean, it was about, about me uh, and learning that. And then in the fall, um, I did not stop learning, but participating as a co-facilitator and listening to uh, white people uh, talk about this process, there was a holy listening that uh, this is this spiritual direction, group spiritual direction really came in here and holding that space simply as a group facilitator and as, a, as another white person, holding that space, listening to white people's stories about what as they're beginning to learn about racism um, touched me uh, spiritually on a much deeper level. Entering that space every week was certainly holy work. And I began sort of looking for something to um, help bind it together. And I was looking for a phrase. I like phrases and quotes so I can put them on sticky notes and post them around the house. It sort of reminds me of the work that uh, we're doing. And I thought I made this up. It, and the, the phrase is tithe against racism. And I, and I, thought, I, I, I thought I'd coined a term, but actually it was in 1963, our Sergeant Shriver Jr. was a, during a speech to the National Conference of Religion and Race, suggested that church members tithe against racism. Um, so I can't claim it as my own, but I can certainly claim that practice, the practice of tithing against racism. And every week, twice a week, sometimes uh, when I enter into this holy space, this conversation um, and holding that energy, it is indeed tithing against racism. So I feel fortunate that I have this opportunity as a reminder, because as a white person, it is easy to forget. It is simply too easy to go back to the way I was before and not do the work, but I can never go back to that. So it's good work to do. Thank you. You're good. Sorry, this background blurs my timer. Uh, Dominique. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, growing up in, in the South, um, I was pretty much surrounded by um, racist imagery, Confederate flags, and, you know, people um, saying all types of words that they really shouldn't. And um, leaving Georgia for the first time in my life and enlisting in the, in the military, in the, in the Navy, um, that gave me a, a really expanded outlook on the world. And I took that, my, my experience in the Navy uh, 
with me with um with with my work to do um i was always used to being around all kinds of people and working with all types of people and one of the things that i realized um that there there are some people that really don't know history or have had some type of a uh, history that was not true. And one of the things that I, I enjoy the most about my work to do, uh, especially being a facilitator, is, um, is people uh, doing the work and learning. And even as an African-American, that's really a good thing for, for me to see. And honestly, it's helped me in my own ministry as well, seeing people grow and change and coming back and back again to see them do the work. And um, it's, it's been a, quite a journey. Um, I've been a facilitator for maybe about six, seven months, I believe. And um, every time, every session is different because you're seeing different people all the time and they have um, different stories and I, and we have a time to share our own. So um, it's good to see people grow. good yeah Allie. hi everyone so um i was raised in uh, right in the heart of the religious right in the south uh, in a really patriarchal fundamentalist culture and uh, found myself still in those spaces uh, just a year ago just a little over a year ago homeschooling my kids and a part of evangelical church and um, after the, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, I just started asking some questions. And when I asked questions, I was silenced um, and disciplined and erased. And so I, um, I found myself not um, having those same spaces of belonging that I'd had before. And I reached out to someone on social media who I didn't even know. And she said, you've got to try uh, this program I worked to do. And she sent me the website. I had no idea what it was. And um, I can't really express how grateful I was that I landed in this place um, for a lot of reasons. Um, one, because I was so fragile uh, when it came to faith and religious spaces, it provided a really safe environment for me to not feel like I was being indoctrinated um, and to not feel like I was, you know, things were being forced on me um, that I wasn't ready for. It was a really welcoming, open space um, there were a lot of people of faith there, but it wasn't in the forefront and led with. And so it allowed me to trust uh, the space and the people there. Um, it also allowed um, some time with each new piece of content that was presented. It was like a little bit more of that, that puzzle and that journey um, towards understanding. I felt like every, my eyes were opened and, and I really thought through things and, and I'm still greatly impacted every time we read an article or we see a video. Um, it's different every time. Um, so just the pacing and the, the patience, I think, um, with what the space is created to be was really timely for me. And it allowed for that growth, just a place to be able to express how I'm feeling and to be with people that I feel like are on the same journey and committed to the same work is really priceless, especially in this year with COVID, where there's so much isolation and so much division. And so I really did get to feel that sense of belonging. Um, and that's, that's priceless to me. That's, that's a real treasure. And then the encouragement and the hope that I've been able to see as other people do that work, as other people grow. Um, I, I still feel like I'm growing and learning with them. I don't, I don't feel like I'm at that level yet where I'm ready to even um, teach anyone else. Um, I feel like I learn right along with each, each group and each time we watch the content. Um, I think one piece for me has just been able to 
the idea of listening is so important and to not be talked over and to be able to really practice using my voice and being heard and seen is, is really important. And so learning to do that with others, learning um, to do that myself and build that stamina, to have those uncomfortable conversations, to be brave and say things that I may not say somewhere else. Um, it's just been a really great tool to have and to use in my life. And it, it definitely has impacted how I carry that outside of the space in my own circles and my own friendships and my own family. Um, so yeah, I'm just really, really grateful. Thank you. Liz. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to start actually by talking a little bit just about the impact of George Floyd's lynching on this country and on me in particular. It was an apocalypse in the sense of a revelation um, that just laid bare the systemic racism and in cruelty and brutality in this country. Um, as a woman of color, as a Chicana, um, I was disoriented, in pain, and also a little lost as to how I lead in my congregation, which is multi-ethnic, multiracial, with a definite Latinx flavor um, through these times. Um, I saw a lot of stuff on Facebook about uh, people saying, do not look to people of color to make you feel better, to train you, to teach you, do it yourself. This is to white people, white people telling white people, brown people telling white people, black people telling white people. And I thought myself, right, and they haven't done such a great job of it up till now. Well, why would we think that, that we just left each other alone, that they're gonna figure it out? Certainly my church, and I love the Episcopal church, but it's still the second widest denomination in this country. So obviously we haven't figured it out yet. And then um, I, in a conversation unrelated with Suzanne, who also happens to be my comadre, shared with me that um, she was doing this work, my work to do. Um, and I'll be just be honest with you, anything Suzanne does, I wanna be a part of. Um, and so I, joined and actually announced it to a couple of people in my church. And I had one woman in my, uh, one of the leaders in my church, Melissa Ridland, who I would say can probably date her Anglican history back to Cranmer, um, joined me in this. And I want to say that first it's changed our relationship because I have a group in my church of white middle-class loving, caring people uh, up here in the Bay Area who are very open to all kinds of things, but don't have, didn't have a space to process all that they were learning, all that they were hearing, were afraid to come to me because, well, for good reason. <laughs> and this has allowed Melissa and I's relationship to change in a way that I can be her pastor, but I can also engage her and she can engage me on issues around race, um, on how do we actually change not just our relationship together, but in the congregation. I've also found it helpful um, as a woman of color when colleagues approach me and say, I don't know what to do. I know I'm not supposed to ask you for help. I just had this conversation recently with um, a, a colleague of mine who, who's the rector of a very wealthy white church, who they also have been doing their work. I said, I don't, I, he just says, I don't want to do the same thing of like, like, we'll all just sit around and I don't know, share coffee or tea. And it just kind of goes to that. And I said, I don't want to either because every experience I've ever had in every diocese I've ever had been with in a white church, white wealthy church is that it doesn't go well. But I said, there's a place we can all meet. There's a place called my work to do. If you get your people and I get some of my people we can begin a conversation there, not necessarily talking to each other, but learning ways that we can talk to each other and maybe interacting in some of the rooms, maybe not, but I think there's where we begin uh, acknowledging who we should, where we stand, where each of us stand in terms of our race and our location, but also the kind of relationship that we may be able to have at this point in our life. Thank, Thank you. you. Keith. 
Hello, uh, it's good to be here. Um, so my experience with my work to do, I have uh, been in conversations like this since high school and um, attended workshops, facilitated some as well. And let me say, first off, that you will not do better with uh, my work to do. I mean, so it is just a phenomenal program. Um, it, it, it leverages the Zoom space better than any other meeting I have ever attended. Um, it uh, reaches out and includes and it involves people from uh, all sorts of backgrounds, uh, all different locations. I mean, in one of my meetings, it was like people from outside the country and in any local experience, um, uh, you won't get that diversity of experiences. Um, so it, it is a phenomenal program. And it, 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 it does not feel like it was, and, and I, you can verify this later for me, but it does feel like it was created in the Zoom space. It doesn't feel like it was a, an in-person small group and then it migrated over to Zoom space for the pandemic it really feels like this is where it grew up. So, um, you know, so, uh, so at the very least attend one meeting so you can learn some very practical tips about how to manage the Zoom space um, and small groups, uh, two very, very important necessarily, uh, necessary tools uh, for the church going forward. Um, in my own context, it's, uh, um, you know, majority white congregation. And so that type of diversity um, and the, the approach of my work to do targeted for, for white people is, is ideal for this denomination. So it is, it is not bad. Um, from my congregation, it's inspired people who I think were, you know, um, headed in the right direction anyway but it gave them uh, the tools, the stamina to begin a, another book study um, and a commission uh, for racial equity and justice and really kind of gave people, you know, concrete things and, and the community to, to work with. Um, and for myself uh, as a professional preacher, it's given me uh, a sermon illustration or two, but more than that, just a whole hermeneutic, a whole way of approaching the text, the gospel, my sermons. Um, it, it, it will change the way uh, you preach and lead. Um, so very practical things, but also designed for the long game. And on, as a rector, I wanna build church leadership with the people involved in my work to do and I want to build a church based off the principles with my work to do. Um, I want to build a church that my work to do graduates are proud of and would want to attend. So um, if, so I, I can't think of a more higher uh, endorsement than that. So it is, um, so try it. Thank you. Okay. Hi, um, I am a black college student right now who just graduated high school during the most recent president's last term. And those four years of high school definitely have shaped my journey for social justice. I've never been one to speak out. I've always been a very shy and introverted person. And it's only because I had to experience many occasions of microaggressions at school and racist rhetoric coming from my own teachers towards me, coming from my classmates who thought I was dumb for being the only black kid in an AP class and from random people on the street who just didn't like me because of the color of my skin. But my work to do has allowed me to reflect personally and it is allowed for growth. It has also taught me about having patience when it is necessary, especially when people come to learn about what it means to be an ally or want to understand race. 
and I always have to check myself because I am a person of color. So race will always be a, de de um, a big factor in my life. And they're not a person of color. So they don't understand the trials and tribulations that I have to go through on a, on a daily basis. Um, my work to do is important and it's necessary. It is necessary because when we talk about the systems in the US, we're talking about racist systems, not just regular systems. We're talking about systems that continue to oppress and discriminate people, especially against people of color. And talking about race is uncomfortable, but that's the point of it. We need to talk about it more so it's not uncomfortable. So it's a reoccurring topic. So then we can dismantle these systems in hand. And that's why it's important. It is also important to think about the fact that your loved one or someone you care about or just a random human being in the world has to face economic, social, cultural, and political inequality because of the color of their skin. Not because of their personality, not because of how they view the world and how they interact with people, but because of the color of their skin. They are deemed of as, as unworthy and as not valuable to society. And my work to do is important because it showcases and teaches about why it is important for white people to stand up to other white people and to the systems at hand to show them that how effective life is because of these systems that continue to opp oppress people. And it's important because this talk is important and it can it can foster bigger work, which then can foster legislation, which then can foster change, which can foster people not having to worry about if they are going to experience police brutality or if they're going to experience being victims of white supremacy because of the color of their skin. And my work to do takes a deep dive into why organizations such as Black Lives Matter are happening and why people are protesting about stopping Asian hate. And it's because these systems and privilege. And it's important to talk about privilege because basically white people benefit from this privilege. And so for people coming here, it is important that you speak about this privilege because you are fostering change. And even though it seems that this change is barely happening and it's not occurring, it is because then you're fostering this with your children and your grandchildren. And it is important as a person of color to show to know that I'm not alone in this journey and this fight. Thank you. Erin, I'm gonna see if you unmute. Yep. Hi. Um, I am I just want to say that my work to do has been really in um, changing me from the inside out. I'm so grateful to have Suzanne in my life and to for all that Suzanne and the other um, creators have created with my work to do. Um, it is a it's a space it's a space of transformation. Um, that's how I would that's how I would describe it. Um, I came in to my work to do feeling desperate, um, feeling the need to do something but not know what to do, feeling sense of guilt, shame, um, overwhelm about being a white person and not knowing even where to begin um, and thinking that what I needed to do was go out into the world and change everything around me first. Um, and what I really learned in my work to do and continuing to learn is that um, the work really needs to begin inside me first. I mean, I know that's an easy thing to say, but that it was a hard thing for me to really get. And I got it um in in the sessions there's some really the growth happens in the sessions and and in between the sessions and by that i mean you know we're we're learning content and we're sharing in a brave space and we're listening to each other and there's something very transformational about going through the process itself um it's not an academic experience it's a for me, it's been a, a spiritual experience um, and it has really changed me. And by that, I mean, instead of needing to focus on changing everything around me, which you know, one day I may be ready to take real action, what I have learned is that 
what, when I have changed inside me, it is making me see things in a new way. I have a new, new lens. Um, and I'm able to show up in moments when um, I need to use my voice to speak out against racism, to, to, to talk to other white people. Um, you know, an example would be um, looking for preschools for my daughter and asking questions like, how many black educators, how many people of color, you know, are educating in your school? What is the, what is the student body look like? Um, those are questions that are vital to me now. Um, and I think would have been before, but in a different way. Um, and so I'm able to be more clear. I'm able to be more present through having done this work. And I learn from the people around me. I'm always learning. Um, and the way that it is led is such uh, so powerful and so thoughtful and so smart. Um, it's, uh, I'm sorry, Suzanne, I can't tell if I'm going over time. I think I am. Okay. Um, the, the experience of being in this session, I know that there are people who have told me, you know, I really want to do it, but I'm afraid I'm going to be overwhelmed or feel guilty or something, shame will stop them. Um, from doing the work and because it is overwhelming um, as a white person to really, to really stop and think about what whiteness has done to the world and is doing to the world. And to know that the whiteness that I am is contributing to that, um, it is overwhelming. Um, but to show up and to step into brave space means that I'm already taking action. Um, there's already a movement happening. Um, and I've been really grateful to have that space. Um, and, and also to be able to trade in my guilt and my shame for something more powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Jody. Thank you. Um, so when the pandemic started and it was at the height of a lot of mo movement with Black Lives Matter. Um, I remember listening to sermon after sermon and one of the sermons that really stood out to me was one where they were talking about um, Jesus sitting by the well and having a conversation with a Samaritan woman and just the example of racism that was just blatant during that time and that he, because he's Jesus and God, um, out of his love took time to sit and listen and that conversation needed to happen. And so I'm listening to this and I, it kind of was like an aha moment for me where I've been having conversations, but I wasn't having conversations with white people. I was having conversations with my black friends. We were just talking about it constantly. And I was learning about um, my African history and learning about the legacy of greatness that preceded before enslavement and just feeling like, what, like, a, a sheet had been lifted off my eyes like wow wow who told all these lies why why didn't we know this why didn't we know that there were you know African queens who who led wars and conquered lands why didn't we know that some of the wealthiest people were black people that black people birthed civilization and contributed to so much of what we have and why aren't why isn't that more and I realized that I never questioned school I grew I have the advantage of growing up on an island in the Caribbean where everybody looks like me pretty much. And so I didn't really know I was a black person until I came to this country. And I never really like questioned, why did I have to know that? Why was that a thing? And what is this American dream? And why does only certain people have the American dream and others don't? And so it was just like going through all of that. And I was searching and searching and I found the group and I think I emailed Suzanne and Alyssa and stalked them and pestered them. And they, I was probably seeming so out of my mind because I'm like, wait, so you're a group for white people? Like, can black people come? And I was literally just asking those questions in, in this authentic way. And they were just so real and answering like, yes, you can come. And that was the first time I heard it may not be a safe space for you. So then I'm like, well, what kind of meeting is this? That's not going to be a safe space. And what are they going to be talking about? So it was kind of like, well, maybe I need to get in and hear from them and hear what they're thinking. And that'll help me. And so I came to the first meeting and it was just like, I don't know. It just felt there's like a saying, like sometimes a place feels like home. 
and I use that kind of loosely to say it just felt like the right, like our worlds collided at the right time. And I just needed to be there. And I knew that I needed to be a part of it um, in whatever capacity, even if I just sat and didn't really speak um, or I spoke. Um, and what was great was that in my work to do, you can be your authentic self. You can be real. You can be transparent. You don't have to worry about tripping over words or saying something that's going to offend someone because that is the work to be uncomfortable, to get to that point, to figure out, well, why did that offend me? Why did that bother me? Um, and just really talking about the real issues. I've learned so much. It has transformed me as a woman, as a person who's black, understanding the difference between people of color and still being a black person, because that is a very different and distinct category. It has helped me as a mom to advocate even more for my kids at school. And as a teacher, just re realizing that, yes, like Kendall, I agree to be patient, but it's a patience with urgency where I really just don't have time anymore for people that make excuses or don't want to know or learn or say like, oh, I don't see it. Really? Are you sure that happened? Um, I just want to get to let's make this sustainable. Let's end this once and for all. Like it need, we need to do better. Sorry, I don't know. You're good. You're good. Uh, Alyssa. Yeah, it's so crazy to listen to everybody um, just sharing their reflection, reflections and so beautiful um, because I'm reflecting back to 2018 when Suzanne, and, Suzanne reached out to me um, and was like, hey, there's this article that uh, came out. Um, do you wanna hop on a Zoom call and discuss it? And it was Suzanne, myself and another um, woman that I participated in the Episcopal Urban Intern Program with and we had been, so ever since I, I graduated the program in 2013 and for five years, I was telling Suzanne, I'm back in these white spaces. I'm back in, I, I'm from Wisconsin, um, a predominantly white, predominant, uh, wealthy area of Wisconsin where I wasn't having these conversations with anyone and I was yearning to have them. And then to go to LA, participate in the urban, uh, the Episcopal Urban Intern Program through Jubilee Consortium, and then meet so many people from so many walks of life that opened my eyes to the lie of racism, the lie that white people buy into and believe and, and tell ourselves every day, and then to go back and have it just yanked away and not have any space to have those conversations anymore. Um, Suzanne created that space. She found that, that space. She carefully designed my work to do this space. Um, and it's just been such a blessing to <laughs> work with her on it um, over the years and just to see it grow from a group of friends who wanted to, you know, discuss an article to now a, a group of people that to what to Jody's point, like a family, like a home, um, a brave space to come together and have conversations that are desperately needed. Um, but that we aren't like, at least speaking for myself, I don't have access to um, locally. And so um, it's just been such a, such a journey for me. Um, I have learned so much, mostly from listening to others. Um, and when you watch other people grow and you're growing and evolving and learning new things and coming every week with new ideas and new discoveries and um, hearing what somebody else said and then uh, following up with that resource later to dig deeper, the growth is just, um, it's incredible. And it's, uh, I think Erin talked about this, but it has, I, I have built stamina to the point where I am showing up at my workplace in my family conversations with friends, with strangers, um, uh, in times where I would have stayed silent in the past, in times where I would have um, just gone along with the status quo of white supremacy that just keeps on going if we don't interrupt it. And um, my work to do has given me um, the ability to uh, have those conversations both obviously in the group, but then outside of that and to get involved, you know, to give me the courage to start other groups and get involved at work um, and share things with family and friends that I never would have uh, been able to before. And more than anything, I'm just grateful for all the people that I've met over the years and all of us, the co-facilitators, um, the participants that keep coming back and all of us that are building a true community that I really think is unlike anything else um, in the United States. So I'm really proud to be a part of it and really grateful 
for Suzanne. So that's it. I think that's everyone who's a facilitator. Um, so you said Q and A, but I wrote a few things down. Um, unless someone who is here, who's not a co-facilitator or a co-facilitator. Um, the things that I wrote down were, um, I used to talk to Bishop Diane and just say, I just, this is like a, I think of racism as it's a spiritual crisis. And I think of whiteness in particular, it's a spiritual crisis and it's, it's hurting everyone. The white people themselves aren't the problem. Whiteness though is hugely problematic um, and it has impacted all of us. And so um, the, the article that Alyssa referred to was, um, Jennifer Harvey's article, White Women Learning Calculus in a School Building on Fire. That was the article that started all of this. And it really did, like you said, Keith, it, it grew up, it started and grew up on Zoom. So we went on Zoom for three years. We were perfectly poised for this. Um, I would say that that's probably not a mistake that that happened or a coincidence even. And I think this particular context can, can hold that as maybe we were getting ready to be ready. Um, and um, I think that for a lot of us, one of the biggest questions that's continuously asked is why didn't I already know this? So how am I 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, and 20? How am I a history teacher? How am I actually a history professor? And I didn't know about this. So for some people, it was um, conversations about the Tulsa massacre. I am so tired of reading people's Facebook posts about the Tulsa massacre. How did they not already know about this? Um, is one person in my conversation on this screen. And I said, you should come and listen. Just come and listen. You can leave your screen off. I invite people of color to come to this space. Um, this space, this, this screen right now is actually atypical. We always have people of color in the group, but really it is a space for white people and people of color who are comfortable in all white spaces. So we do say that it is not designed to be a safe space for people of color if they do not already see themselves as allies to white people as they are doing this growth work. There are people of color who are just like, I can't listen to it. I just cannot listen to people as they're doing this. So I do invite people though to come and have their screen off if they want to do that and listen. And for people of color, it really is an experience um, and a kind of new one to listen to white people dive so deeply into the topic of race and specifically the racial part about being white. Um, and so um, uh, most recently, one of the projects, because we have three different curriculums at this point, um, started off as getting started, which was the first five weeks of content. Um, and then because there were so many people who had gone through that, uh, we designed a second curriculum, which is called Going Deeper. And then most recently, we have a kind of a small group that comes again from someone in this group. When I, um, when the June, January 6th event happened at the Capitol, um, I just know that I talk about race all the time and all of the people pretty much here know that, but uh, because I'm fascinated by watching it just everywhere, it's everywhere. And a lot of times people don't even know, right? So, but what I do know is that um, I'm not proximate to people who are um, proximate to QAnon, as well as to people who um, support some of the things that were going on in our government um, prior to the recent election. And since I don't have a lot of that, I do feel called though to create spaces for people who need that conversation. I may not like to hear what they have to say, but not talking about it isn't helping anyone. So I got in touch with someone who's on this screen um, and said, you know, you have people in your life. I've listened to you talk. And we don't like, we really do honor that if you don't want to talk about something outside of the circle, the person is welcome to say to you, you know, I'd really rather not talk about that outside of the circle. Um, but I said, I really would love to start something for people who are QAnon proximate or at least um, proximate to um, the comfort with the last, um, with the way that, you know, before the election, don't want to talk about names, but anyway, so um, we have a group now on um, another, like a third group that is for people who are living in places where, um, where QAnon as well as um, like the current, <laughs> the Trump reality and stuff that those are comfortable places for them. But there are people who are like, no, something's not right there. And I don't have anybody to talk to about that. So we created a group 
um, for people who are in that situation, because I'm sure that that is real and that is there. Having talked to a lot of you, even at some of your family members even, and I don't know them. So um, we welcome that space. And to be honest with you, during the last uh, year and a half, this is a space that has given me hope. Like some days when it's really hard to even get out of bed. And I mean that like literally this space and holding this space um, made it possible <laughs> to get out of bed because at least I know there are other people who care deeply about this and wanna see something be different um, and are willing to just sit and, and kind of grapple through it together and hold the space for other people. Um, it's interesting to have people say they, they come, they are in the space, they can see the value to it and then they leave and they can't find other people to come. Um, because it is to some people a scary place, you know, it, it's hard to move into talking about this on a regular basis and to move into comfort with the discomfort. Um, and it's interesting to watch people change over time who um, at first will ask a few people, the people say like, oh, cool, that's so cool that you're doing that, but don't ever come. And then to watch that shift into um, being comfortable talking about it, like, um, like some people mentioned, talking about it with family members now, talking about it, because it doesn't need to be an argument. That's not serving any of us. It just doesn't, nothing gets better. For us to sit and argue about this, nothing changes and nothing gets better. But we do need to really start to learn how to listen. And, and it's okay if we don't agree. We don't need to. Uh, we certainly aren't changing anything by not talking about it though. That's for sure. Um, and then I tell people, what has happened here? The lie that Alyssa, um, racism is a huge lie and it is intentional. And for some people that is one of the hardest parts to integrate is that these systems were set up on purpose for only certain people's gain. And it actually doesn't, it didn't start with, well, we hate people of color. We hate people because of the color of their skin. That wasn't the beginning of the ideology. It was to profit. And the way we, we, we set up the profit here in the United States, the way to make it happen, you have to have laborers and those laborers, the cheaper, the better. So if you can buy them and do it for free, well, the, the better, right? So that's where this comes from. It's the result of that, but it is intentional. Um, and I always tell people to observe it everywhere you go. Just like look for it every single place you go. And you don't need people of color to be in your context in order for racism and whiteness to be working and be at play. We don't need to be there, um, but it is definitely everywhere in, in the interactions, whether we are there or not. So I think that's all I have written here. Um, I don't know if there's particular questions or really just anything that we think collectively. I guess I'll open it for the people who are not co-facilitators, if you have questions, and then if anyone thinks that there is anything we need to additionally address um, for people um, who might be watching this video, I wanna say like, I love the Episcopal Church and um, she is sick though. We are so highly white that that is data, just that alone. It is data, like right for those people who are really into numbers. Those numbers say something about who we are. Um, and so each day, like, like this is what helps me to know that I wanna stay. Um, and I think for some other people, there are people on this who are Episcopalian, there are people on this um, in our group right here who aren't Episcopalian, but they care enough about this. There are people on the East Coast right now, which right now in California, it is almost eight o'clock at night. So it's late, but they are here and they show up because this is so important and so grounding that they know that it is really an important um, space to be in. So if there's anything that we think we should address or any questions that those of you who are just here with us, but haven't facilitated or maybe haven't even attended, if you have any questions, please, um, you can either unmute or put in the chat or Yeah, Mr. Taylor. So I'm John. Um, and uh, the, the, the feeling I've had um, uh, uh, listening to the testimony um, has, uh, has been about the sort of courageousness of the work. And what's brought me up uh, short listening to Canon Edwards Acton is her talking about this third group, which is actually uh, sort of confronting uh, our, 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 our toxic system at its place of greatest toxicity. And um, uh, I, I, um, uh, 
am so uh, uh, humbled to learn about that and and um, and curious of, and there might not be enough time to talk about it tonight and I don't want to uh, ask a too long question but I'm I, I'm just so curious about that only because from from what I'm seeing about um, our national narrative right now um, that the, the, there are some folks in our country who are completely unreconcilable to anything resembling a fact-based narrative and yet still this ministry that you have is going right up to that place and and i just uh, am feeling just humbled and astonished to hear about that thanks um so i will probably never be able to make any change in the mind of someone who is believing those narratives but i do know that they have family members and friends and people who love them um, and care deeply for them who are trying to make sense out of it so those are the people that this space is really um probably, well, I know for a fact, um, is here to serve, is what do I do now? Like, I'm watching this happen. I'm watching my family member. I'm watching this person that I love. I'm watching this neighbor who I don't love, whatever, but that I care about because they're my neighbor. Um, and I don't know who to talk to because actually I'm not watching one. I'm watching numbers of my family members. I'm watching numbers of my neighbors. Um, I'm in an environment that pretty much that's, that is everybody here in this particular place. Uh, believes this. Um, where do I go? Who do I talk to about that? Um, and so I it really is for that person, those people um, is the space that I created. And again, I think part of it's just because it's I'm not proximate to it. And probably someone who was that deep in doesn't really want to be around me anyway. <laughs> um, but there are family members who care about them, who see another way. Um, I want to understand better another way. Um, they are definitely out there and have, and I mean, I've met some, so we know for sure that they're looking for places and spaces to, and they're looking for like a community. Um, someone talked about um, like political and spiritual orphans. I think that was a really powerful term that one of you used with me to share that with me is that there are people who feel very lonely <laughs> um, and want, a place to try and make some sense out of this and really out of care. So, yeah. If anyone else has something that they want to say to that. Yeah, definitely right. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of along the line of what you were just saying and what the Bishop was saying that I had a thought that I want to make an appeal to white men because I, I believe that toxic masculinity and performative masculinity drives white supremacy and upholds these uh, internal biases that we have as white men. And as a white man in this group that's participated, that appeal is to other white men that may see this, that this is a safe, safe space. Yes, it's a brave space, but it's also safe to explore your vulnerability around these feelings and make a contribution to end the uh, toxic masculinity and the performative, performative masculinity that helps drive white supremacy. So I heard that an hour is kind of a sweet spot. So does anyone else have anything we want to say or share or we think is important and significant to say before we, um, yeah, how are we? Can I add one more? I just wanted to say kind of what Rick was saying too, as a person that has experienced abuse at the hands of church leadership and also um, white men, I, it's hard to describe how healing it's been to be in these spaces with both religious leaders and white males that are humble and kind and really making an effort um, to, to do this work and be loving and caring. And that, I didn't expect that out of this group, but I'm, I'm almost always in a breakout group with someone in that role. And I think I've said that to Keith before too, like it, it, it just provides a lot of healing for people to experience people in those leadership positions and those um, that, that white male position in a positive way. That's just my own personal um, experience that I've, that, that I've had. Thanks. Anyone else wanna have anything else to share? We have a particular way that we close. So Samantha, um, do you tell me when you're ready and then I'll, we'll 
do that. Yeah. Um, if, if we're good, I want to just thank you all for joining. Thank you so much, uh, Ken and Suzanne, uh, for this wonderful introduction on my work to do um, for this very powerful ministry. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be posted on the Diocesan Facebook page and YouTube channel. Uh, the link to the recording will also be on the convention website at www.diocesanconvention.com. Uh, you can also learn more information and register for upcoming sessions at myworktodo.com. And um, that's it for me. So thank you so okay. much for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. Hang on for one second. So yeah. Kendall's going to read something to us, and then we're going to just sit in silence, and then we'll ask you to just stop the recording at that point. Okay? All right. Sounds okay. good. Kendall. Kendall. As a form of acknowledgement that people of color are chronically subjected to the impact of unresolved racially charged microaggressions, as well as current and historic systemic oppression, my work to do sessions purposefully do not include thanking or congratulating white people for participating and with intention do not incorporate an explicitly gentle slash neatly wrapped up slash feel good ending to the circle sessions. We just sit in silence for a moment and we acknowledge that we've done important work here tonight. 